Good afternoon, everyone. The three of us have the challenge of keeping you awake after lunch. So we'll, we'll do what we can. Looking at Africa as a whole, as a whole, uh, to me, when I look to the future, the greatest challenge for the continent's security is governance, or the lack thereof. And by governance, I refer to a state's ability to respond in an accountable and transparent fashion to the demand and needs of its citizens. Now, threats to African security will emanate from within each state, within each society, because of the governance gap on the continent. And while I believe that the days of external military incursions by one African state into another are for the most part a thing of the past with some looming notable exceptions perhaps, the civil unrest and violence within an African country due to poor governance or political repression will spill over its borders and affect its neighbors and the sub in a subregion. In this context, I believe that Africa's security space will be shaped more by the levels of investment into infrastructure rather than anything else. I believe that the investment of infrastructure is in some ways more important for Africa's future than terrorism. How Africa as a continent can marshal the resources for a massive investment in infrastructure that improves positive networks and connectivity, because there are negative networks and connectivity, but positive ones. This is roads, rail, ports, power generation and distribution, water systems, fiber optics, information systems, it goes on. Well, these networks and this, this connectivity will determine whether the continent will be resilient enough to navigate a fast approaching horizon of significant risks and challenges. The development of these networks that foster connections for, uh, for resources of human, financial, and goods will be a primary factor in determining the continent's future prosperity. Lack of networks, lack of infrastructure suggests poverty. This will require a daunting shift in governance and economic policy as well as an unprecedented level of continental and regional cooperation that has yet to exist on the continent. The durable solutions to civil unrest, extremism, and displacement rest in the economic and social arenas and not necessarily in the military. I had an old boss who said that the best social vaccine against extremism was democracy. And I still believe that. There's a risky horizon in front of Africa. And some of the elements on that horizon are such like climate change, which is already affecting the continent and thousands have been displaced and will continue to be displaced as desertification pushes populations into burgeoning African cities. Population itself, the growth will have Africa, Af population growth in Africa will see in, by 2050 over 2 billion people on the continent. One in four people on the planet by 2050 will be an African. One in 10 people on the planet in 2050 will be a Nigerian. With that country alone becoming the third most populous nation on earth after India and China, more populous than the United States. Africa is and will remain by 2050 the youngest continent on the planet. By 2050, the average African will be in her early 20s and living in a city, looking for a job, and demanding services from municipal, provincial, and national authorities. By 2050, the average young African city dweller will have more in common with other urbanites around the world than her own compatriots living in rural areas because of connectivity. The global population by 2050, if not earlier, will be an urban one and city life will be the norm, not rural communities. And with some of the highest urbanization rates in the world, cities will dominate Africa's political politics, economics, and social condition. Now, throughout history, urbanization has been a generally a good thing. It's been a factor that has helped add to economic growth. But unfortunately, that has not happened in Africa. Africa is the exception. 
Urbanization in Africa has not generated this economic growth dividend, largely due to poor governance, inadequate services, and the forced displacement of populations into cities because of rural poverty. Job creation for these ever urbanized, increasingly interconnected youth will be a primary concern for African leaders. Every year, for the next 15 to 20 years, Africa has to generate 18 million new, new jobs <coughs> as youth enter the marketplace. That's equivalent to the population of Burkina Faso, 18 million jobs every year for at least 10 years. This will require an investment in infrastructure of around 100 to 100 billion dollars every year that will provide the basic services to spur and support economic growth, or about one to one and a half trillion dollars in 10 years. Which, by the way, is about the amount of money that is leaking out of Africa due to illicit uh, flows of capital, uh, you know, illegal flows, how can you put it? You know, the fiddle where people put their cash overseas in Swiss banks and don't invest it back in their own country? You know what I'm talking about. Connectivity in terms of rapid communication, trade, finance, and ideas are defining and designing our future as we sit here today. Connectivity is accelerating. And those societies that try to stay ahead of this phenomenon, who can manage this, will prosper. And it's not a question of controlling change. You cannot control it. But being resilient and adapting to its effects, that's the challenge. Devolution or decentralization of governance will be a factor in tomorrow's political landscape for Africa. The age of governors and mayors, rather than presidents or prime ministers, may be more ascendant. And the ability of national governments to manage their citizens directly may prove increasingly problematic, at least at the minimum, more complex. In Africa, as in the rest of the world, cities have been around for millennia. Nation states, for the most, maybe 500 years. But frankly, if you really look at the nation state, it's really since the Second World War, when all the colonies were made independent. Which is more resilient, nation states or cities? Municipal administration and infrastructure will be tested in a fashion unknown in human history over the next 50 years. The quality and character of urban life will be a major security driver. The existence of slums co-located to or found within established municipalities is already a problem for African societies. It's already a problem. How does one keep it from getting worse? How does one look to resolve it? The future will place even greater pressure on African uh, cities to support their populations. To give you a sense of the scale in terms of population movements and what's happening now, Europe is grappling, the European Union is grappling with the movement of migrants across the Mediterranean. About 175,000 a year, give or take. Within the metropolitan complex of Johannesburg, Swanee, and Pretoria, that area has ha been having to cope over the last 10 years with an influx of about 225,000 people a year. Every year, for the last 10 years. More than what's crossing the Mediterranean, more than the number of people that is overwhelming the European Union. And this is happening not just in South Africa, it's happening across the continent. Now. I've been asked to talk about APSA, you know, the African Peace and Security Architecture, and can it, can it manage this future? Is APSA, the African Peace and Security Architecture, established by the EU in 2002, around there, and recently updated with this roadmap, able to address the challenges of the future? I'm not so sure. I don't think so, right now. How can APSA work when many of Africa's ruling elites 
may be the same actors inhibiting better governance on the continent. The primary stakeholders within the African Union are nation states. The primary objective of nation states is to preserve the regime. And how is that happening on the continent? African nations, APSA stakeholders are nation states of the AU whose interests seem to be more driven by regime protection than by expanding liberal economic capitalism. We just have to look at Togo, Burundi, or Kenya as the most recent example of how governments and their leaders seek to perpetuate their rule at the cost of national institutions and popular will. If we look at Rwanda, Ethiopia, Chad, or Angola, we see regimes that seem more interested in a form of authoritarian or autocratic capitalism that seems to foster cronyism, corruption, and income inequality. These aren't sustainable either. Yet, at the same time, these countries are still major players in Africa's peacekeeping architecture. So the question is, can the AU truly police itself? What is the threshold for action in this architecture of security and peace? Is it humanitarian crisis, stolen elections, human rights violations, government repression? The political and humanitarian crises of Gabon, Zimbabwe, Burundi, DRC, ROC, Republic of the, of, of the Congo, Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan, Zambia, and now Togo and Kenya suggest no. The threshold has yet to really be found. It appears that APSA is allowed to work up to the point where either the country facing a serious security challenge is structurally weak, such as the Central African Republic, the Gambia, and maybe Lesotho, or when the interests of neighboring states are directly affected, such as the Eastern DRC, the Sahel, or Lake Chad area. While APSA has placed a strong emphasis on institutional responses to security challenges, African security standby force, the early warning, conflict mediation, you know, small arms and light weapons, interdiction, counterterrorism, it appears incredibly weak in developing the means to address the drivers of insecurity on the continent. What is APSA doing to address the drivers of conflict on the continent? Developing and utilizing forces to kill terrorists does not eliminate terrorism. In fact, it can have the opposite effect. If such kinetic operations ignore the economic, social, and political elements that push disaffected, disillusioned, and disenfranchised youth into the hands of opportunistic killers with extremist ideology, and there's going to be a lot more youth coming down the pike looking for something to do and who's going to address their needs. From my vantage point, focusing attention on making African cities secure and safe centers of opportunity, education, cross-cultural communication, creativity, and active democracy is what APSA should focus its attention upon. If networks and connectivity are the keys to prosperity, protecting those networks, both real and in the cyberspace, should be a priority that spans across borders. If cities are Africa's future, the emphasis on public safety, police, municipal services, emergency and fire response, and effective intelligence services will be key. Africa's security will not reside with the military beyond its role in protecting infrastructure that connects one country to another and to the global marketplace. Citizen security, maritime security, cyber security, border security, rather than state security, will be the elements that will safeguard sovereignty and not the existence necessarily of a standing army or a presidential guard. The day that elites dominate the continent's political trajectory is fading. As technology brings newer and younger voices into politics, commerce, and civil society. And in this regard, APSA should focus on developing positive and supportive relationships between security forces and the citizenry of Africa. An open, constructive dialogue between citizens and the security forces that are supposed to protect them will not only engender trust, but will offer a foundation of resilience for communities to address these looming challenges we talked about. 
Now, not all African countries will succeed in this venture, and learning to cope and mitigate the impact of imploding or failed states such as South Sudan, Central African Republic, Libya, or Somalia will be a major task for the AU, the PSC, and APSA. And to effectively deal with these troubled states and to avoid additional political implosions in the future, the continent must also burnish its democratic credentials and pull itself out of the current democratic recession in which it finds itself. And the question is, how can APSA play a proactive and constructive role in furthering African democracy? The future is a troubled one. The horizon is a difficult one to navigate. But awareness of these issues and furthering the connection between security forces and the citizens they protect in an effective dialogue that's open and sincere is the solution for Africa's future. Thank you very much.